how, but we're very happy that you're here. And we're going to be respectful of your time. We will finish right around 8 o'clock tonight again. And uh, I'm so happy that each and every one of you took the time out to be here to worship with us. We're going to start out with some singing. So I'm going to call the young ladies forward and uh, we'll do our customary three hymns and uh, then get right into our service. We're going to be singing hymn, hymn number 251, He Lives. on this one, okay?
don't forget the Sabbath. Happy Sabbath, everyone. I'm very happy to have each and every one of you here. And I want to say a special thank you to those who were singing. Uh, raise your hand if you were singing tonight. Just raise your hand. Praise God. We are very happy for that. And I would want to thank Sister Smith for helping us out on the piano. And uh, for the young ladies with their beautiful voices. Uh, you know, this week was a good week. First, first few days of 2015, and uh, God has already been blessing us. Amen. Uh, today, I had to go to the hospital. I did. I went to the urgent care, and that's because I did something that I should not have done. I was writing my sermon early in the morning. My ear scratched me a little bit, itched me. And I poked a pencil in my ear, one of those lead pencils, you know, the removable ones, and the rubber went all the way down. Hallelujah. And uh, my wife tried to take it out with tweezers, and it went further down. And she said, go to the urgent care. And I said, no, we can do it. <laughs> and the more we worked on it, the further down it went. Uh, but... Uh, you know, finally I decided I am going to actually practice what I preach. Amen. <laughs> you know, when you need help, go go get help. And uh, the doctor didn't embarrass me too much. Uh, he just looked in my ear. He said that was easy. Took his little tweezer and just plopped it out and gave me a souvenir. You know, and uh, so now we're we're going to have to rid our house of all mechanical pencils. Praise God. Because if I can do that at 36 years old, I can just imagine what my little daughter may end up doing one of these days. But I'm very happy to be here. Very happy to be able to hear voices sing. Amen. <laughs> uh, very happy to be able to worship with you tonight. And uh, 
We have had a wonderful time so far, and I pray that God's blessing will be with you tonight as we go throughout uh, this season. Tomorrow we'll be having a baptism, and uh, I'm so happy for leaders who remember things. We prepared practically everything, but we didn't put any water in the baptistry. And uh, as Elder, Elder Florence said to me tonight, did you put water in the baptistry? I said, you know, it didn't make my list of things to do today. So I'm very happy, you know, that we have folks who remind us of the important things in life. Amen? And... Uh, <laughs> That would be very, yeah, that would not even be very funny, but you know, <laughs> I'm happy that we caught it now so we can do something about it, but praise God. It's been a good week, you know, we started the year off a little busy, but uh, good busy, and uh, we just pray that God will continue to work with us as we go through tonight. I'm going to ask Elder Florence to come on up and to offer, lead us into prayer. And uh, then we'll go into our theme song and then straight into our sermon for tonight. Uh, so if you don't mind, Elder, thank you. It's so good to be able to talk to God in prayer. That's the closest things we can get to him is when we talk to him person to person. I'd like tonight, if two persons would like to pray, and then I will close with just a very short prayer, but just express your feelings through your prayers. So I'd like to ask Sister Gladys and Brother Smith if you each would say a short prayer and then I will close it in prayer. Shall we stand? Happy Sabbath. One of my resol re how do you say it? Resolutions this year is to know the will of God and not to be like that farmer who um, looked up the skies and however the clouds looked like. He thought he saw the clouds and it looked like a P and a C. And he thought, oh, God wants me to stop farming and go preach Christ. So as his neighbors mocked him and everything, he said, oh, I think I got it wrong. I think God wants me to go back and plant corn. I don't want to be like him. I really, really want my relationship with him to be really effective so when he speaks to me, I can hear his will and not do guesswork. So I'm praying for our church also that we will all seek the will of God. Shall we pray? Our Father in heaven, we thank you for ushering us into the new year. Even with your word that we have been hearing since Wednesday, not everyone has been that far but we don't deserve it but you just offered it to us we thank you for your word your grace your mercy your long suffering in a special way we pray that our church will seek to be closer to you so we can know your will and abide by it help us not to go in our own different ways claiming that we have heard you or we know your will, but let us truly, truly seek what your will is. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Our Heavenly Father, we ask thee, Father, if we, thou will bless each of us here tonight, the Sabbath evening. We ask thee that watch over our loved ones, wherever they might be, the ones that are uh, a little sick and not feeling good and can't be here, but we ask you, Lord, if you that would speak to our heart, to their hearts, and bring us closer. Most gracious Father, we say thank you tonight. We've come to another week, and we're all together in, in one tonight. And as we gather together in prayer, dear God, as we talk to you and you talk to us, let us remind how grateful then, how grateful we should be for the blessings that we know, and that we know you as our Father. We ask for your guidance spiritually, mentally, and physically as we go home tonight, dear God. 
let us rest peaceful and wake up well and strong in the morning to come together and worship in the house of the Lord. We say thank you, God, for your many, many blessings. But we ask let your will be done. Can you all stand and sing our theme song, Higher Ground? Amen. You may be seated. Praise God. Good evening, everyone. I'm so happy to see each and every one of you here. And uh, I know that God has been blessing us so far. And uh, we are coming to the end of uh, this series, but uh, so far we've been blessed uh, to, to uh, go through a few of the topics that we've been dealing with, and uh, really what we're trying to do is to get us in the frame of, of mind to do serious ministry for Jesus in 2015, almost said 2014, but uh, it's 2015. And I want us to know that tonight God has uh, a, a special blessing for each and every one of us. I, I know it, it, it didn't feel like Friday today. Uh, the days seem to be frozen. I don't know if you've experienced that, you know. Every day just looks like the same day, you know. Uh, the, the, the ice doesn't move. <laughs> it's not snowing. <laughs> Uh, but it's not getting any much warmer either. It's just we're, we're frozen almost in time. But uh, any time you're frozen uh, together with Jesus is a good time. You know, we can just stay right there, uh, get some uh, I information that we need, the transformation that we need as we go into the new year. 
tonight I want to once more look at uh, uh, Philippians chapter 3, verse 13 and verse 14. And, uh, you know, the teacher in me likes to do this, uh, likes to go over information because sometimes you hear it the first time it didn't quite stick uh, but if you hear it over and over and over again hopefully uh, a repetition will deepen the impression I, and I do believe that there's nothing as powerful as the Word of God and that's why the Bible says that the word is the seed and and the devil would want to either steal the seed uh, uh, choke the seed, burn the seed, because if the seed sticks, there will be fruit. Amen? And so once more, let's read uh, Philippians chapter 3, verse 13 and verse 14. It says, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling uh, of God in Christ Jesus. And tonight we're really looking at the, the concept of the prize. And uh, uh, our theme for tonight is eternal motivation. Eternal motivation. What is it that causes us to do what we do for, for Jesus? That's the question we're looking at tonight. And you know, it's very important that when we look at this issue we always want to have a picture of Jesus you know Jesus is our example he is our model and uh, if we follow Jesus then we will end up in the right place I remember following somebody uh, up the mountains of uh, Northern California and after that I decided anywhere I'm going I need to print my own directions amen hallelujah I don't know if you've ever experienced that uh, eight hour trip took 24 hours <laughs> and uh, you know after that I said uh, you you need to be careful who you follow and where you're following them too uh, but we have this assurance if you follow Jesus you will never get lost amen and so for our scriptural consideration tonight, we want to look at uh, Jesus as he prepared for his ministry. And so we want to turn to Luke chapter 4, and we'll be reading verse 1 through verse 11. It is a familiar passage. I'm sure we've all read it before. But there are some deep spiritual truths that we can get from this passage. Uh, uh, this passage is filled with with some good stuff and so before we read it I do want to ask if we could just bow our heads for a short while while we ask God's presence to be with us father God now as we open your word we pray that your presence will be here tonight we have come Lord not simply to 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 to, to speak into the air but we've come for transformation we've come to destroy the devil's kingdom and to erect your kingdom here uh, on earth as it is in heaven so bless tonight help us not only to be hearers of your word but to be doers also it's my prayer in jesus name let all god's people say amen amen luke chapter 4 verse 1 through 11 this is what the bible says then jesus being filled with the spirit returned from jordan and was led by the spirit into the wilderness and uh, I, I find it very interesting that uh, uh, before you prepare to to move forward sometimes you gotta sit still and think about what you're going to do sometimes you need a time of reflection a time of fasting a time of prayer for you to uh, 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 empty your mind of, of all the stresses and the strains of life and think about what God is trying to do through you. And I think many times we, we run too quickly ahead of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Uh, many times we are too quick to be active and, and not as quick to seek God's uh, uh, answer in prayer. And, and, and many times we embark on ministry, we get burnt out and then we fall away. Why? Because before you grow high, you need to grow deep. Amen. 
uh, before you start building a skyscraper, you need to dig deep into the earth because that is going to be your anchor to keep you from whatever elements life throws at you. And so we see that before Jesus began his three and a half year campaign, he started out with prayer. Amen? He started out with fasting and prayer. And the Bible tells us that he was tempted for 40 days by the devil. And in those days, he ate nothing. And afterwards, when they had ended, he was hungry. And, and this is very important because, uh, uh, you know, many times we fast, uh, or I should say sometimes we fast, uh, because fasting seems to be out of fashion these days. People don't like to fast. We will feast. Hallelujah. Praise God. Invite me to a feast, but don't invite me to a fast. Why? Because we, we, we've got blood sugar problems. Come on now. You know, uh, the church is filled with folk with blood sugar problems. And if they don't eat, they're going to die. <laughs> You, you know, uh, all of a sudden, young people have blood sugar problems. The little kids have blood sugar problems. The older fo everybody have blood sugar problems. Uh, you know, so they say, Pastor, we can fast, but we'll just fast from looking at television. Come on now. Or, or we'll fast from checking Facebook. And even that, folks can fast from. Uh, uh, but nobody knows anymore how to just turn everything off. Food, everything and just focus on trying to find the will of God. And the funny thing about it is at the end of the fasting, for many people, uh, 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 after the fast, it, it, it would have been better for them not to fast. Come on now. Because as soon as the fast is over, uh, the fast is over. Come on now. The feasting begins and we eat Anything in any amount, and, and we get sick afterwards. Anybody ever experience it? Don't raise your hand. Come on now. Uh, just say, mm, if you've seen it, if you've witnessed it. Uh, uh, but, but it's interesting. This is very interesting because the Bible tells us that after Jesus uh, ended his fast, he was hungry. He was at his lowest point. And it is at that point that the devil came to him. See, when you finished your fasting, your work isn't done. And a lot of times we've experienced this after a, a period of intense spiritual campaign, intense spiritual yearning, we end up falling. And we do it time and time again. And that's why some of us, we don't even like to go to anywhere too spiritual. Come on now. We just like the regular spirituality, the everyday run-of-mill spirituality. Because the moment we go to a high point, we know what's coming next. The low point is coming right afterwards. We look at people like Moses. Moses was a man of God, but, but after dealing with God's people for 40 years, he grew tired. Come on now. Uh, Elijah was a man of God, but after uh, 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 doing a great work on Mount Carmel, he grew tired. And, and he who was a stalwart ran before a woman, just her word. Why? Because he was tired. Many times we have to learn how to pace ourselves. You know, my wife would tell me sometimes, do not come home tired. Hallelujah. Come on now. You, you, you work outside and you give all your energy to outside. And if you come home and there's an emergency, you can't do anything because you're too tired. You should always have something in reserve. And that's the practical application of the parable of the ten virgins. Five were what? Wise and the other five were otherwise. You know, the, the wise always have something in reserve. So even though Jesus was at his lowest point, are you still with me? He understood the dynamics of spirituality that it is at our lowest points that the devil seeks opportunity to overcome us. So let's listen to what the devil does when the devil comes to Jesus. The first thing Satan says, if you are the son of God, 
command the stone to become bread. And Jesus answered him words from the book of Deuteronomy, uh, words which he himself had spoken to the children of Israel thousands of years before. He said, it is written, are you still with me? Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word which comes from the mouth of God. Then the Bible tells us the devil takes him up on a high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment. And the devil says to him, all this authority I will give to you and their glory for this has been delivered to me and I can give it to whomever I wish. All you need to do is to worship me. Jesus says to him, get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. And then the Bible tells us that he brought him to Jerusalem and set him on a pinnacle of the temple and said, if you are the son of man, throw yourself down from here. And then the devil quotes scripture. Do you know that even when the devil quotes scripture, he's lying? Some folks still ain't got it yet. Sometimes you can quote scripture and, and you're saying the words, but the way you say it is not the way it's supposed to be said. Come on now. Your very if inflection is off or you drop a few parts off. You know, the story is told this young man, he wanted to get into Bible study. Maybe it was his New Year's resolution. And his method of studying the Bible was open the scripture, to wherever, just randomly pray to the Lord, open the scripture, and wherever his finger pointed, that's what he was going to read. And uh, he opened the Bible, his finger pointed on the, the, the place where it says Judas uh, uh, committed suicide. Said, well, the Lord couldn't be speaking to me. Let me try this one more time. And, uh, and, and, and so he prayed and opened the Bible again and pointed on another passage. And the passage said, whatever you're doing, do quickly. Uh, he quickly gave up that, that, that concept. Amen? You see, sometimes you can get the Bible to say anything you wanted to say uh, if you are not respectful of Scripture. And so even when the devil quotes Scripture to you, he's lying. Come on now says he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you and he drops off in all thy way from from psalms uh, and, and it says and in their hands they shall bear you up lest you dash your foot against a stone and and the bible tells us that jesus told him uh get uh, 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 uh you shall not tempt the lord your god question tonight what is your motivation for doing ministry. When we look at the temptations of Jesus, it really is a temptation that comes at the beginning of him trying to figure out what he's trying to do to save the world. Are you still with me? And, and let me paint the background for you. Here is the temptation, the great temptation for ministry. The devil will come to us and tell us it doesn't have to be as hard as God is making it. See, when Jesus went into fasting and prayer, do you know why you fast and pray? You fast and pray because you know what's coming up. And you have to be ready for what's coming up. I like the fact that uh, most firefighters, they don't do much. You realize that most of the days they don't do they don't do a lot of stuff. They're just in the firehouse. And what are they doing? They're not really chilling. They're exercising. Yeah, they're getting their. I'm, I'm gonna put a good spin on it. Hallelujah. They're exercising. They're making sure their equipment is ready and everything. Doing push-ups, doing fire drills, yeah, making beans and stuff like that. Whatever, you know, they're getting ready. Because whenever it's time to move, it's time to move. 
Jesus was getting ready for what he knew would be a conflict. And the devil comes to him and says, you don't actually have to go through all of that. There are some shortcuts that, that we can take and you will end up with the same results. That's the big temptation. And so when you read this passage, it doesn't look that big of a deal. If you're hungry, what's wrong with eating bread? Come on now. When you're hungry, don't you eat? Come on, raise your hand. You're hungry, you eat. So that doesn't seem like a temptation, except for the fact of what the devil was trying to say behind what he was, what, what, what he, the words he spoke to Jesus. And so here it is. What are some of our motivations for doing ministry? Let's go with this. Some people do ministry for, for the food. This is what Philippians chapter 3 verse 19 says. Whose end is destruction, whose God is their what? And whose glory is their shame, who set their mind on what? Earthly things. It always cracks me up, the, the number of nonprofits we have in the United States of America. And most of them are in it for the money. <laughs> You know, you donate a dollar to a charity and 75 cents out of every dollar goes towards administrative costs. Come on now. And, and, and it, it, it seems to me that a lot of people take the work of God as a job, a, a way of getting money, you know, providing for their family. And I know it, 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 it talks to pastors specifically. Amen. So I'm preaching on myself a little bit tonight. Amen. Uh, and that's why Jesus talks about the hireling mentality. Come on now. You're just there to get paid. So if you see danger, what does the hireling do? Runs away. <laughs> Leaves the sheep to fend for themselves. Why? Because for me, I'm just in it for the food. Amen. I, it's just a job. What's your motivation for doing ministry? Some people, their motivation for doing ministry, they do it for the fame. This is what the Bible says in, in Acts chapter 19, verse 13 through 15. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists took it upon themselves to call the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, we ex ex exorcise you by, by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. And, and, and these were seven sons of who? Sceva, a Jewish chief priest who did so. So they weren't even Christian. But they saw something that worked. And they were going to put it into their uh, uh, scheme to be able to, to, to become famous from, for, for being uh, exorcists. The Bible tells us that the demon said to them, you know, we know Jesus. We know Paul. We really don't know who you are. <laughs> a lot of people do it for the fame. You know, they, they do it to set up their own thing. They, 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 they want to be known for being great at, 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 at spiritual things. What's your motivation for doing ministry? Other people do it for the fortune. I wish I had one of those cars, though, by the way. You know, my little car, you have to be careful how you open it, you know. Uh, sometimes if I don't do it correctly, I have to go through the passenger side. Anybody have a, a car like that? No? No? Nobody? Pray for you, Pastor. Come on now. Pray for you, Pastor. This was the temptation. Uh, uh, some people do it for the fortune. They do it because money is involved. And it's tax-free. Before you start working for God, you got to figure out why you're doing what you're doing. The reason you do what you do is you do it for to make a difference. You're not doing it for food, fame, or fortune. Yeah. You know, I have a couple videos on YouTube. And if you're not careful... Uh, every time you go on, you check in to see how many hits, you know, how many views. Did you get into the million? Only cats and cute babies. Come on now. 
those are the only things that get, get up there. Nobody's doing that for, for the word of God, unless you're T.D. Jakes or somebody like that. So, so you got to have your mindset correct when we do ministry. So when the devil comes to Jesus, he comes to Jesus as he will come to us with the three major temptations that we have when we do a mission for God. And tonight we just want to focus on those three, give you some principles, then we can go home. Principle number one, we're tempted to distrust God's provision. First great temptation. This is what Ellen White says in Desire of Ages. She says, Satan comes to Jesus as an angel of light, sees him after 40 days fasting. You know how people look after two days of fasting. Said, wait a minute. A good God would never put you through this. Let's solve this problem. If you are the son of God, <laughs> your father told me to tell you, just turn the stones into bread. Many times when we're doing ministry, you don't actually see the provision right before your, your eyes. Amen? You start out, you never have enough money, you never have enough people, you never have enough time, you never have enough anything. And if we are not careful, we begin to develop a murmuring spirit. Amen? Lord, why you bring me in this place? Come on now. Why, why is it that those who do good for God never have anything? And, and, and we don't realize that man doesn't live by bread alone. Your ministry or your mission in life will not be great because of your balance sheet. It will only be great because God's provision and God's blessing is on your life. So that even with a little, you can do a lot for God. So whatever you do, never distrust God's provision. It doesn't matter what the situation looks like. If God's hand is in it, if he called you to do it, he will provide a way. He will make a way out of no way. Amen. And every time we turn our eyes away from mission, to figure out a way how to get enough provision, to, to gather a provision so we can feel secure in what we're doing, we, we, we fall to the temptation of the devil. God is more than enough for whatever he called you to do. Temptation number two. We're tempted to presume God's provision protection so for some people we don't have enough faith <laughs> and then for other people our faith is so much <laughs> that we will go places God never asked us to go <laughs> are you still with me <laughs> so, so that's the second thing the devil tried with Jesus the devil said do you know what is a quick way of finishing this work just jump off the temple. And when the people see you just float in the air and just fall very softly, nothing happens to you, they will, they will surely believe you then. Sometimes we do stuff God didn't ask us to do. Stories told of many ministers who uh, somehow believe that God called them to minister to single ladies. Come on now. Hallelujah. My call is to minister to single ladies and uh, those who, who are professionals. Amen. I'm going to use the word professionals. Hallelujah. Because we have kids in the audience. Professionals. That's my call. And I feel a strong calling to minister. And I'm going to do it by myself. Come on now. I don't need no help. If nobody goes with me, me and Jesus will go. Praise God. 
And that's not the only issue. I had a friend long time ago, far, far away, nobody knows, ministering to a certain community, would go with members of that community, and before you knew it, became a part of that community. Sometimes we go places God didn't ask us to go. Amen? See, God's protection is with us when we go where God asks us to go. When we go where God doesn't ask us to go, we are on the devil's territory. And I don't care what is before your name, bishop, pastor, doctor, whatever. There are some things we shouldn't do because it's not safe to do. Jesus says you don't need to be tempting God. You don't need to be jumping in front of the train and see if you'll be translated. Come on now. Use your faith to do what God has called you to do. Don't, don't try to be supernatural. Temptation number two. Then temptation number three. We're tempted to compromise God's province. So here's, here's what that means. Do you know you come into a situation and you see the power structures. You see that if you're going to make a difference in this place, you have to know certain people. Hallelujah. Come on now. You got to take certain people out to lunch. You got to hobnob. You got to rub shoulders. You got to you do a little deal here, a little deal there. They're not going to build your church. Well, you just take out your roller decks back in the day. Call up the mayor because you and the mayor are friends. Hallelujah. Come on now. You've done favors for him. Now it's time for him to do favors for you. We, 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 sometimes we make compromises with the power structures because we don't believe God is, God is still king. And that he reigns in the affairs of men. Are you still with me? The three Hebrew boys never said, you know, king, we have served you so well. Give us a chance. They say, we serve a God who is bigger than you. <laughs> so you can do whatever you want to do. We go serve the Lord. And the devil tried that trick with Jesus. Follow what I'm saying now. This is what the devil said to Jesus. I am in charge of the world. And I can give whatever I want to give to anybody. And the temptation here was he knew Jesus' mission was to what? Conquer the world for Christ, for God. Amen? He said, you don't have to go the route of the cross. You can just make a compromise with me. I will give you everything. <laughs> and the only thing I'm asking is for you to just, well, that's kind of backward. Because then I wouldn't have anything I would still be under your dominion. And by the way, while we're talking about dominion, this is still my father's house. Amen? It's still my father's world. He built it. He made it. And, and you had nothing to do with it. So I'm not even going to give you that. And many times the devil comes to us and says, this belongs to me. And when we deal with him, compromise with him, strike bargains with him, we're actually buying into that fundamental lie. This world still belongs to God. It's a world in rebellion, yes. But it's still God's world. And if God wants it to be done, <laughs> there is no power structure on this earth that can stop it from happening. And when kings behave as if they have a, a, a nobody bigger than them, then God comes in and breaks them, Daniel tells us, without hands. So he doesn't even have to use human instruments. He does it himself. Why? Because this is still God's province. He still runs this place. 
When you do a mission for God, never forget that. Never compromise that. Amen. Never buy into the lie that, you know, some places belong to the devil. Can't do anything in Las Vegas. That's Sin City. Come on now. Can't preach too much here in Salt Lake. It's Mormon territory. Do you know that even in Loma Linda, we have some of the biggest mega churches in Loma Linda. They're not even Adventist. Hello, somebody. <laughs> God can set up anything, anywhere he wants to because he's still in charge. So let's close up. Our only defense against the devil's temptation is found in the word of God. And by repeating the word of God to the, to the devil, Jesus didn't enter into an argument. Are you still with me? Jesus didn't enter into a debate. Jesus spoke the word. And many times in church, we talk opinions, but we don't talk scripture. So here are three things that we need to know. Your only, God's provision is your only source of strength. God can sustain you through anything. I was thinking about that today. God can sustain you through anything. You know, some people, they think, can't live without smoking. Can't live without drinking. Can't live without sex. Can't live without my friends or my family. I, I, I need it. It's my drug. God is your only source of strength. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. You realize God led them into a wilderness, and he knew what he was doing. He said, there will be nothing here but me, and I will be enough for you. We need to start relying more on God's strength. Secondly, God's way is our only security. If you want to get there safely, go God's way. <laughs> don't take, don't turn to the left or to the right. I find this interesting. Do you know one of the commands in scripture is every leader should have a copy of God's law. But they shouldn't buy it at Lifeway. The Bible says they should write a copy for themselves. Write it out. Do you know why you write it out? Because when you write it out, you have to read it. You're seeing it. You're touching it. it it's, it's, it's impacting you on so many multiple levels. It becomes ingrained in you. Why? Because God wants his leaders to understand his way is the only way you can go and still be sure. Then the last thing, God's dominion. Is the only sovereign will here. His will will be done. His will will be done. Jesus was able to start his ministry off powerfully. His mission powerfully. Why? Even at his weakest stage. He knew three things. He knew that God's provision was his strength. I'll look to the hills from whence cometh my help. My help comes from the Lord. He knew that God's way was his only security. He will hear a voice saying, this is the way, walk ye in it. And he knew that God's dominion was sovereign. You're not going to worship any other gods. Worship the Lord and him only shall we serve. So this year, the, the challenge for us is, are you going to compromise? Are you going to fall for the temptation? Or will you speak the word? At your lowest point, will you say, he is my strength? When you're the most confused, you will say, his way is sure and secure. And when folks give you the power play, you know the power plays? They tell you at school, if you don't do it this way, you're going to fail. Come on now. They tell you at work, if you don't do it this way, you will never work in this town again. 
God saying, are you going to stand on my word or the heavens fall? Tonight, that's the challenge. And I pray that as we go forth in this year, don't go too far without spending some time in fasting and prayer so that the issues become very clear. Very, very clear. The devil will come to you as an angel of light offering to take off the load, make it easy. But God says, my way is the only way. You want to pray that prayer tonight. Lord, show me your way, because we know your way is the only way we ought to go. Thank you. Let's pray. Father God, tonight, if we only had a 10,000 tongues, Lord, we could tell of your marvelous greatness. Tonight, Lord, we see in Jesus the model of what weakness united with your strength can do. Your word says, submit to God, resist the devil, and he shall flee from you. So, Lord, tonight as we search through our motivations for why we do what we do, help us to see that our only security is in your word. Help us to stand in your provision. Help us, Lord, to stand with your direction leading us where to go. Lord, finally help us to stand under your dominion, knowing that we are your children and the sheep of your pastor. Your word says your sheep hear your voice and they follow you. Help us to hear your voice tonight and follow you. It's my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for coming out. God bless. Uh, we will see you tomorrow morning. We're having a wonderful service planned for tomorrow. We'll be having a baptism. And uh, I'm really excited about that. I know God has blessed us to start the year off with something that reminds us what the mission of the church is bringing folks closer to Jesus. So I ask that you have a wonderful evening, uh, safe trip, and uh, we'll see you back tomorrow morning at 9.30 for Sabbath School.